Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for joining our Neurology Live webinar on the impact of COVID-19 on multiple sclerosis management. I'm Alicia Bajika, Editorial Director for Neurology Live, and I'll be your host this evening. Tonight's webinar, which has been organized in partnership with the Women Neurologist Group, is intended to provide you with the latest clinical guidance and real-world experiences for best managing your patients with MS through the COVID-19 pandemic. While information is changing nearly hour by hour, we hope you'll find the information in tonight's presentation to be actionable as you work to preserve your high level of patient care through this unprecedented time. Before we get started, I'd like to remind everyone that we will have time to answer some questions at the end of your presentation. You can submit questions via the Q&A window that's on your screen. With that being said, I'm happy to introduce Dr. Mitzi Williams, Assistant Professor of Neurology at Emory University and Medical Director of Joy Life Wellness MS Center in Atlanta, Georgia. Dr. Williams, take it away. Thank you so much, Alicia, and thank you so much to Neurology Live and the Women's Neurology Group um, for sponsoring this talk, and I, I hope that everyone finds it impactful. Um, it's interesting because there is, although there is not very much uh, data in terms of scientific papers that have been published, there's a wealth of information. So I will do my best to try to summarize some of the guidelines and to try to pull out some of the pertinent points that hopefully will be um, uh, useful to you all in practice. So we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, first, we'll start with my disclaimer, so to speak, um, and just similar to what Alicia said, you know, our understanding of COVID-19 um, is emerging and evolving on a daily basis. And so um, there's a lot that we don't know about populations that are at risk for this disease, and there's a lot that we don't know about the course of disease as related to MS. The information that um, I will be presenting today is based on current recommendations from several of our large um, societies um, here in the U.S. as well as in other parts of the world that have a lot more experience with COVID-19, um, but these are subject to change. And also, they are largely based on expert opinion since there is not much scientific data available. So what is COVID-19? So I'm not going to get very deep into the immunology, but just kind of a basic overview. It's a novel coronavirus. Um, there are other coronaviruses um, that uh, we have heard of in the past, such as SARS, there was an outbreak of SARS um, in the mid-2000 uh, teens or 2016-15. Also, Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome, which was similar to SARS, um, are ones that we may have heard of in the past and have some experience with in our scientific literature. Um, COVID-19, which results from the SARS coronavirus uh, that most recently has uh, been, uh, that we've learned of, is a new virus um, that uh, there first was an outbreak in Wuhan, China in December 2019. So that's really the first that we heard of this virus. And it's a thought that it was transmitted from animals to humans, whether that was via someone eating something um, or what have you, we're not really sure. Also, we know that it's transmitted primarily through contact with respiratory droplets, whether that is someone directly sneezing or coughing on someone else, um, or whether they're droplets from someone sneezing or coughing and it landing on a surface and someone else touching that surface. There are some suggestions that it may be airborne. And then also there were several cases reported um, where it may be thought to be uh, present in feces because some people have diarrhea or uh, GI symptoms associated. But primarily um, what we understand is that it's through respiratory droplets and that's how the transmission occurs. So what are some of the characteristics or symptoms of a COVID-19 infection? And this is a table from a paper that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine um, in early 2020 uh, from the data from Wuhan, China, and it just lists some of the most common symptoms. Uh, nasal congestion is a symptom. Uh, many people have a dry cough or sore throat. Um, there's fatigue. Uh, some people have diarrhea or nausea or vomiting. Also, there are myalgias or muscle aches. So some of the symptoms are very similar to the flu, um, which is um, how many people um, may have confused it with the flu or many people who had symptoms were flu negative when tested. And that's how we began to test people for COVID-19. Also, symptoms that are not listed here that have become more prominent are people have loss of smell um, and loss of taste. And so those are two symptoms that are a little bit unique. They can occur in some other uh, upper respiratory issues, but the loss of taste and loss of sense of smell are two uh, symptoms that we've seen emerge over the past several weeks and past the past month or so uh, that are very unique to uh, COVID-19. 
So who's at increased risk for more severe disease? So are there certain groups of people that are at risk to develop the infection? And then are there certain people at risk uh, for a more severe course once they do develop um, an infection from COVID-19? And these are some of the, uh, re some of the uh, suggestions from the CDC and from the WHO. So the CDC uh, reports are on their website, they suggest that adults that are over the age of 65 um, are at increased risk for a more severe course of disease. Also, people who have an, a history of asthma or chronic lung disease are at increased risk for more severe complications because the primary complication that people have with severe disease is a respiratory or uh, acute respiratory distress syndrome. Also, severe obesity has emerged as a risk factor for people at any age that can put them at increased risk for uh, complications, as well as people who have underlying medical conditions like poorly controlled diabetes, chronic kidney disease, and liver disease. Another group of people that are suggested to have increased risk are those that are immunocompromised, and we'll talk about that on the next slide. According to the WHO, very similar recommendations, older people, those with underlying medical conditions, um, those are the ones that they suggest are more likely to have problems once they develop COVID-19. Now, this does not uh, suggest that these people are necessarily at more risk to develop the disease, but they're at more risk for a severe course once they develop the disease. What are the factors that contribute to be uh, people or considering someone immunocompromised? So this is very important, particularly for our MS population, because that's one of our concerns with many of our disease modifying therapies. So this is again, according to the CDC, people who have a prolonged use of steroids or other immune weakening medications are considered um, to possibly be immunocompromised. Those who take cancer treatments, smokers or long-term smokers, people with poorly controlled diabetes, and those who have recently undergone um, hematopoietic stem cell transplant are thought to potentially be immunocompromised as well as those with uncontrolled or untreated HIV. So it does not mean that each group of these people are, are uniformly immunocompromised, but these are some of the factors that can contribute to considering someone to have potential um, immune compromise. What are the current theories about risk of COVID-19 in multiple sclerosis patients? So there are three theories. So I've done a lot of reading um, of different blogs. I've listened to a lot of webinars from many of our experts around the world and uh, read several papers, uh, one, uh, several of whom were related to COVID-19 as well as other um, co coronaviruses. And so what we found or what I found from doing kind of a search of all this information is that there are three theories about um, what the risk is for people with MS. So number one, um, there's a theory that MS patients who are taking some of our disease-modifying therapy, particularly those that are immune depleting, may be at increased risk for a more severe course of disease. So if the thinking is that these people may be immunocompromised, and this may put you at risk for more complications. So that's one theory. And that is the one I think that primarily most of our recommendations from our societies and et cetera are based on. Number two, from reading, there are some who feel that Although our DMTs may weaken the immune system, the level of suppression with the medications that we use for MS, the majority of them, um, is not as severe as the level of suppression, for instance, other, with other groups of people like those who are taking therapy for cancer or for people who've had transplants. And so potentially the risk of more severe disease or complications with COVID-19 may be low because even though the immune system may be weakened, it's not weakened severely. And then the third theory that I've seen more recently, probably in the past week or so, is that maybe some of our disease modifying therapies actually are protective and may prevent some of the severe effects of COVID-19. So the primary issue that we're concerned about is acute respiratory distress syndrome, which is related to severe inflammation. Now, there are other complications that are in the literature, but that's one of the major ones um, that puts people in the ICU and on the ventilator. And so maybe the fact that our MS patients are taking medications that dampen the immune response and decrease inflammation, maybe that may confer some protective effect. And actually several of our MS medications are in testing for treatment uh, of COVID-19.
What about the risk of developing? So what about the risk of developing um, COVID-19 for MS patients? So the bottom line is that there are no, there's no current evidence that suggests that just by nature of having multiple sclerosis, you're at increased risk of developing COVID-19 infection. There also is no current evidence that suggests that just by nature of having MS, it increases the risk of more severe disease. However, as we discussed on the last side, and as we'll get into a little bit more throughout the talk, the concerns are for those who are taking immune weakening therapies, especially the immune depleting therapies, some of our higher efficacy therapies, as well as there may be a potential risk for worsening of symptoms um, or relapse for those who do develop a severe infection. There are uh, multiple different um, guidelines that have been released over the past several weeks. Um, certainly there are some from the MS Society, there are guidelines from the MS International Federation, the Association of British Neurologists, as well as the Italian MS Society. Those are the main ones that I will cover today and there are several of that have been um, published. But again, there's very little actual research um, that's been published and done in a systematic way on COVID-19. So these are largely based on bodies of experts and their expert opinion, and these are subject to change. And many of them have been updated even in the past week or so when they were just released three or four weeks ago. What about the National MS Society? So there are some guidelines that are on their website for both people living with MS as well as healthcare providers. And there also have been some in webinars that have been done in the past several weeks with different experts to talk about some of these um, best practices as well as to talk to patients about some of the ways to prevent infection as well as what to do with your disease modifying therapy. So the recommendations are that we follow the CDC guidelines as well as recommendations for people at risk and those are on their website. Um, also, they recommend that MS patients should not discontinue their disease-modifying therapies, but that they should discuss the risks and benefits with their healthcare providers. And then if through that conversation, it is thought that they should stop their therapy, then proceed from there. But people should not uniformly just stop their therapy because of the COVID-19 epidemic. The next recommendation is that if people are initiating or starting treatment, um, we should consider maybe not starting a cell depleting disease modifying therapy because of potential increased risk for uh, a severe course of disease. And that again, it should be a shared decision making process with the patient and with the healthcare provider um, to talk about their individual risk for severe complications from COVID-19 and then to choose a disease modifying therapy based on that. Now, the Italian MS Society came up with the first set of guidelines, and I actually was pleasantly surprised that it was very easy for me to get this translated. I thought I was going to have to call one of my colleagues to get it translated, but uh, thank goodness for Google Translate. Uh, so I did get this translated. And so these are, it's just kind of a summary of their recommendations. So again, they also recommended that there is no clear evidence that people should interrupt therapy because we also want to take into account the risk of MS becoming more active, especially if people are stable on their therapy. So so they kind of um, categorized, and most of these recommendations categorized um, not medications in terms of what they consider low risk, maybe intermediate risk, or maybe high risk, potentially. So they recommended continuing therapies, especially for the injectable medications, which includes interferon and glutiram or acetate, also for the oral medications, and as well as natalizumab, one of our infusions. So they recommended those as relatively safe to continue. Um, without postponing, and then in terms of postponing therapies, that may be a consideration for um, our anti-CD20 um, anti uh, um, monoclonal antibodies as well as cladribine. And alemtuzumab was not particularly listed on that one, um, but that is one that is listed throughout many of our other medications. So they recommended um, con uh, potentially postponing retreatment, but also postponing initiation of treatment if that's something that was not done prior to the uh, epidemic or the pandemic. Also, there were uh, special considerations that were mentioned. So if someone, for instance, is taking cladribine and they took the first half of their cycle before the pandemic started, the Italian MS Society recommended that they continue or complete the second half of that cycle to complete the full cycle um, for efficacy um, and that um, 
they consider uh, postponing the next cycle. But to complete the second half of a cycle, whether it is cladribine, whether it's ocalizumab, any of our medications where you have to split that first cycle in two, they recommend it continuing and completing that first cycle, even if it's during the pandemic. For active COVID-19 infection, they recommended suspending all um, therapies um, until the infection clears, uh, with the exception of potentially interferon because it may have some possible antiviral effects. And it actually is uh, in a clinical study looking at that uh, for COVID-19 treatment. And then the other recommendations that they did, they made specific recommendations about travel, um, you know, that patients should try not to travel or use public transportation, that they should wear masks in public and that they should wash their hands appropriately. And they also recommended that if patients can work from home, that they should try to work from home. The Association of British Neurologists released a second set of uh, guidelines, and they were also very similar to what we saw in the Italian guidelines. So they uh, categorized medications as low risk, moderate risk, um, and, and higher risk. So the low risk medications, again, were our platform or injectable therapies. The oral therapies that they singled out were uh, DMF, dimethylfumarate and teraflunamide, and then also natalizumab uh, was thought to be low risk. For moderate risk, they did list fingolimod. Um, and for that therapy, uh, that was primarily because of the, the lymphocytopenia or the low white blood count that's associated with fingolimod. However, even though they classified it as moderate risk, um, because there is a risk of rebound or reactivation of more severe disease, if you stop fingolimod, they recommended that if people were on it, they should continue it because the risk of reactivation or rebound likely outweighs the risk of COVID-19 infection. And then for ocrelizumab, they recommended considering delay of infusion for those who are already on therapy. For um, as high-risk medications, uh, there were several that they recommended not to start during the pandemic, and that included cladribine and alemtuzumab. Um, they considered. They also recommended considering a delay of the second round of therapy if someone has started the first round, and then alt and then subsequently for alemtuzumab, if someone was being considered for a third or fourth round, they recommended starting an alternate medication instead. Um, during the pandemic. And then for hematopoietic stem cell transplant, they recommended to delay that until the pandemic is over. And for those with active COVID-19 infection, again, recommendation to consider all DMTs, um, to discontinue all DMTs um, until the infection is cleared. But again, making sure that we weigh the risk versus the benefit for those medications that can cause or, or do have a risk of rebound or severe reactivation of disease after several months off of therapy. The MS International Federation um, has guidelines, again, that are very similar to some of the other ones. Should not discontinue treatment, should consider the risk versus benefits for the oral therapies, and then for treatment initiation, consider starting DMTs that don't specifically reduce immune cells. So they recommend that you could, uh, or so their recommendations were that interferon, glutarimer acetate, and natalizumab were fairly safe, and that we should weigh the risk versus the benefits of others, and then consider delaying doses of other medications, including our monoclonal, uh, our other monoclonal antibodies, um, and our immune depleting. Uh, medications, as well as considering um, postponing hematopoietic stem cell transplant, and if someone had recently had um, HSCT, to extend their isolation um, because of potential increased risk for uh, infection. So what about um, practice? So should we still be seeing patients in, in the office? So there certainly are some offices where they are conducting uh, in-person visits. There are some patients that do need to be seen urgently. Um, and many of my colleagues that I've spoken with or been in contact with, either through social media or by telephone or email, um, are adjusting their practices. So many people are reducing the number of people that they see in the office. Many people are also spacing their patients out so that there's appropriate social distancing. So they may just have one or two patients patients in the lobby, depending on how large the MS center is, but decreasing the number of folks so that they can be appropriately distanced. And then, of course, there are patients who do still need infusion therapies. Um, but again, people are, are decreasing their volume somewhat to try to uh, make social distancing um, uh, appropriate. 
However, many of my colleagues are also converting to uh, telehealth or telemedicine appointments, and that uh, can be done in a variety of ways. For some folks, there are telephone visits. For those that do not have access to smartphones or um, are not able to access certain technologies, but many of us are doing uh, video visits. My clinic is fully converted to uh, telehealth, so I'm doing um, tele-video visits with audiovisual components. Um, and fortunately, during the pandemic, there has been um, a loosening of some of the regulations for telehealth and telemedicine. So there are changes in reimbursement where uh, CMS may be reimbursing uh, very similarly for Medicare uh, telehealth as an in-person visit. Also, there are changes to regulations about practicing across state lines, as well as allowances uh, for changes in site of care um, so that patients who may be in other states, especially for those of us that have or have worked in large MS centers that are referral centers, we have patients that live other places and come to us. There are allowances where you can see those patients even though they're in another state at home and also allowances where we can see new patient visits um, because some states don't allow you to see new, vi new visits via telehealth. So that's made it a little bit easier. And there was a great webinar last week about telehealth. So I won't go more into that. Now, what about specific treatment questions? So we've kind of gone through the guidelines. So what I'm gonna do now is just talk about a couple of specific questions that I think are pertinent and kind of try to summarize some of the things that we saw that were uh, pervasive throughout all of the guidelines. So number one, do our disease modifying therapies place MS patients at increased risk for more severe disease? What are considerations with treatment initiation? Should we adjust dosing of some of our DNTs or what should we consider with continuation of therapy? And is there any other advice that we should be giving our patients during the course of this pandemic? This is a very busy chart, but a great one um, that Gavin Giovannini uh, came up with. He's been uh, frantically uh, pushing out information about um, MS COVID-19, and he has a microsite that's very helpful um, with many questions um, that he's answered for patients and healthcare providers alike. Um, and this is kind of his opinion or summary or thoughts about our different medications and what uh, categories they fit in in terms of very low risk, low risk, intermediate, or potentially high risk. And you can see that in his opinion, some of he had a little bit of differing opinion about some of our medications. Um, so again, the, um, the platform therapies, the uh, injectable therapies were thought to be very low risk. And then dimethyl fumarate and natalizumab, he also thought were low risk in terms of uh, complications uh, from a severe COVID infection. Um, he considered the S1P modulators, including fingolimod and saponimod, to be uh, moderate risk because of the lymphopenia or low white blood count. Also, he considered um, anti-CD20s like ocrelizumab and rituximab, he considered those intermediate risk as well as cladribine. And actually, uh, he, his uh, website, or there's a website that our British colleagues have called the MS Academy. And I listened to a very good debate about whether um, ocrelizumab and cladribine should be considered high risk and grouped with alemtuzumab versus if they should be considered intermediate risk. So I encourage you to watch that if you have the time. But again, the argument being that their mechanism of action, really, um, we don't see as many um, infections as you would expect, even though they're immune depleting medications. So maybe they should not be considered higher risk. Um, but certainly that, again, is a matter of opinion. And then for high risk, he considered mitoxantrone, which many of us uh, don't use very much anymore, um, but also alemtuzumab and hematopoietic stem cell transplant. So you can see that across the different guidelines and amongst different experts, you certainly will have differing opinions, but I think that for the most part, our platform therapies across the board are thought to be safe. And then most of our oral medications are thought to be low and intermediate risk. And natalizumab is also thought to be low risk as well. Um, and then if you start talking about some of the others, there is a, certainly a differing of opinion. What about treatment initiation? So. As we all know, if you're treating MS, every patient is different. So if you've seen one person with MS, you've seen one person with MS. So our treatment plans are very individualized. So there's really no one size fits all for anybody living with MS. And I think most of us know that. But what we can say is general, per most of these guidelines, there's a recommendation that number one, people do, um, that we do consider not starting immune depleting therapies during the pandemic. If you had someone who had very aggressive disease, certainly you would make those decisions on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, but that's the general recommendation. And then the other general recommendation is that if someone has completed one half of a cycle of a medication, such as ocrelizumab or cladribine, that they complete the full first cycle. 
um, even if it's during the pandemic for efficacy sake. Um, and then there also, as talk about a little later on from the Italian cohort, there is a recommendation that if someone is taking ocrelizumab and they're within the first year of therapy and maybe have not been quite stable, that also you consider um, making sure that you treat with that um, second or that first full round during that first year um, for efficacy and to prevent neutralizing antibodies. In terms of treatment continuation, again, it's recommended that MS patients do not just uniformly come off of their therapy because of the pandemic. We want to weigh the risks versus the benefits of delaying courses of treatment. So for those who are on infusion therapies, for, uh, for instance, natalizumab, um, although it's considered intermediate risk, I do have some of my colleagues that are um, con uh, adjusting the dosing of the medication. So they may be doing um, dosing every six weeks or every eight weeks to help with social distancing. So those are considerations to make, but certainly we want to also take into account that if we delay some of these therapies for long periods of time, there may be a risk of rebound. Also, we want to consider alternate dosing regimen, as I said, if someone's on an infusion, and we want to uh, talk to the patient and consider delaying the next treatment course for those who are on some of our long-acting therapies, especially if they've been stable, for instance, on ocrelizumab. Some of those medications can last for longer than the period of time in between our regular dosing and be effective during that time. How should we be advising our patients to prevent um, COVID-19 infection? Uh, certainly we want to advise everyone to wash their hands. And I've seen a lot of videos on social media about different songs that you can sing to wash your hands for 20 seconds. Um, so, you know, whatever song that they like to sing, just making sure that we're washing those hands frequently with soap and water that people are practicing physical and social distancing. I think that we can't emphasize this enough um, there are still a lot of people that are kind of going around about their normal business. Um, many of the states are uh, doing um, orders uh, where people have to stay home, but we want to make sure that people are practicing social distancing, that they're avoiding touching their face and eyes and nose unless their hands are clean, and that they sneeze and cough into a flexed elbow. Um, I've got two small children, and we're working on that. Sometimes it's a little less successful than others, but certainly we as adults can do that. In terms of work decisions, I've had a lot of patients who have called me and asked if they should stay home from work um, because of the pandemic. And certainly if there are cases where they can um, be at home, then we try to work that out. There's not really a current recommendation that everybody should work from home with MS because again, we don't have that evidence that just the nature of having MS puts someone at increased risk. But certainly you would make that decision on a case by case basis. If someone has other comorbidities that may put them at risk, such as asthma or poorly controlled diabetes, or if someone has recently had some of those immune depleting therapies, you certainly would want to discuss that with the patient and then make that decision whether they should be home from work or work from home or be out on short-term disability or FMLA. Um, this is hot off the presses, released earlier this week. Um, and these were the uh, British uh, Neurologist Association's recommendations on laboratory monitoring. And so they recommended some adjustment of laboratory monitoring, again, to help facilitate social distancing. And I'm not going to read through everything here on the slide, but certainly you can look at um, your uh, center's policies um, and then make those adjustments where you feel like it's clinically appropriate. Um, another thing that I really haven't seen, um, I certainly have seen it in some of the um, webinars that have been posted, but I haven't seen the guidelines, is I do think that it's important for us to um, make sure that our patients um, have the appropriate mental health service support, as well as other types of support. It's a difficult time um, for many of us, or really for all of us, um, but particularly um, we know that um, people with MS may have a higher risk of um, comorbidity with depression and anxiety um, just by nature of having the disease. And certainly there are many people that are dealing with increased symptoms during this infection because of fear of infection, fear of infection of their loved ones, or they may even be dealing with loved ones who have been sick or have had complications or even passed away from COVID-19. So I think that it's important for us to make sure these resources as much as possible are accessible to our patients. Um, so there are many mental health providers, many of whom are doing televisits. Telehealth has been um, very common in the mental health field for some time. So we want to make sure that we are um, in contact and letting our patients know about those resources. Some other good resources, is there's a really great podcast with John Strum um, called Real Talk MS. And he's done several topics um, since the pandemic started, including how to deal with the anxiety related to the pandemic. And he just had a recent one 
this week that was with a mental health professional um, just to talk about how we kind of deal um, with some of the issues surrounding the um, the pandemic. So I think that those are that's a good resource. Also, um, many support groups have become virtual. So I also recommend that people tap into those. And then, of course, there's a wealth of information from our societies. People have um, been able to assemble this information very quickly and doing and are doing webinars and ask the expert sessions. So I also recommend that we encourage our patients to tap into those resources through the NMSS, the MSAA, um, the MSF, and also CMS. SC. How about research efforts? So there are two um, medications uh, for uh, MS that are being that are in clinical testing related to uh, COVID-19. So I wanted to briefly mention those. So fingolimod is being tested as a potential treatment for um, acute respiratory distress syndrome, and then interferon beta is also being tested as a potential treatment for its antiviral properties. So again, there may be some credence to the thought that some of these medications could potentially be protective. Um, also, there are multiple other therapies being tested, including hydroxychloroquine, which I know has been a huge buzzword in the news, and also vaccines are currently in human trials. So there's a lot of research that's going on, and the research is being expedited and moving at a very fast pace because of the nature of the pandemic. So I believe that we'll see some of these results, um, you know, much more quickly, much more quickly than we would in a regular setting. Um, I believe that this may be in the first paper that was released about COVID-19 and MS and disease-modifying therapies um, by Gavin Giovannini, um, and it was uh, published in the Multiple Sclerosis and Related Disorders last week. And so I just want to go over um, the, the example case study as well as one other case um, that I'm aware of, and then um, we'll, we're getting close to kind of wrapping up the presentation. So um, this was a case study that he presented in the paper, um, as well as some of the recommendations, including that table that we talked about or that we saw earlier was also published in the paper. And so his example was that there was a 26-year-old woman with relapsing remitting MS who had a recent brainstem relapse. So she had diplopia and ataxia after being stable for about 18 months on interferon beta. She had an MRI done that was about a month prior to her last visit, which showed multiple new T2 lesions and an enhancing lesion in the pontomedullary junction, which was likely the cause of her symptoms. So she was evaluated following the MRI that made plans to initiate therapy with ocrelizumab at her last visit, and her first dose is scheduled, let's say, for the following for next week. And so how will we advise starting therapy for a patient like this? So again, many of the recommendations do suggest that we don't start potentially immune depleting therapies, but we need to evaluate each, each patient on a case by case basis. So for instance, if there is someone with um, more aggressive disease, we may consider starting one of our alternate therapies. Another consideration could be to consider starting natalizumab if it is appropriate. Um, however, it's a case by case basis for each patient. So there is no one size fits all for our patients. And then this was just a case study of a colleague of mine um, who had a 53-year-old woman with MS who had been diagnosed for 10 years, no underlying medical conditions, and they were taking fingolimod for the past seven years with no clinical activity, no MRI changes. The last ALC that was done was about six months ago, was 400, and patients suddenly developed loss of smell and loss of taste, those two symptoms that we talked about earlier, as well as a low-grade fever. They subsequently tested positive for COVID-19, self-quarantined at home with no hospital admission, and recovered after about five days. Um, that particular patient on DMT during symptomatology, um, and that person did well. So again, it's one anecdote, so it does not apply to everyone. But again, there are some cases where people have a very mild course of disease and may do well. Um, other case studies, the Italian MS registry has gotten started. They have about 150 patients. And this is just um, actually a, a graphic that someone posted on Twitter the other day. Twitter has been an amazing source of information. And thank you to those of you who have been posting uh, the MS COVID-19 hashtag. Uh, it's actually been very helpful for many of us to kind of bounce ideas off of each other and learn about what's happening in the field. And so this was just some of the demographics of the patients that they have um, so far in their registry. Um, many of them have a very low EDSS or disability scale. They may have had disease for um, uh, an average of 11 years. Um, most of them have relapsing remitting MS. And then the bottom is that you can see that they've been on a variety of different therapies. So their patients represented here who are on our platform therapies, um, as well as those who are represented on some of our immune depleting therapies. So again, it, 
people can be infected whether they're on uh, some of our milder medications or whether they're on some of our higher efficacy therapies. And I added this slide today because I listened to a great webinar um, that the NMSS did with uh, Dr. Comey, um, who's in Italy, and he talked a little bit about some of the Italian experience as well as some of the preliminary uh, data from their registry. So they pulled data from three large MS centers in Italy, um, and it's a total of about 5,000 patients that are treated between those three MS centers. And there are about 150 patients that have been confirmed positive with COVID-19 uh, for MS. I, I believe that he said at his particular hospital where he worked that they had about 500 patients with COVID-19 at his hospital, um, but there were 150 across the registries related to MS. And these results are very, very preliminary. The data has not been fully analyzed, but these are the things that he shared in the webinar, and I encourage you um, to listen to it if you have the time. So about 90% of the patients that they had were treated at home. About seven to eight patients were hospitalized and about four needed ICU care. Um, he, there was not a clear correlation um, between the outcomes and disease modifying therapies, meaning some of those that needed hospitalization and ICU services were on platform therapies and some were on some of the higher, or some of the immune depleting therapies. So there was not necessarily a predilection that they can see so far between the therapies and the um, course of disease. And then he did recommend or did suggest that the older patients tended to have a more severe evolution of disease and that age was a very specific um, predictor of uh, severity of disease with COVID-19. In terms of his treatment considerations, um, there were some specific questions that were asked and he gave some very loose recommendations. Um, he said that they are using many of their platform or injectable DMTs for mild cases of MS for treatment initiation. Um, they also are using natalizumab for more aggressive cases, um, as well as delaying anti-CD20 if the patient has been stable for some time, particularly over a year, but the they consider continuing or doing that second or, fir or first full round of therapy if someone was in the first year of treatment. So again, a little bit of a, a diversion from some of our other recommendations, but again, everything is based on expert opinion. So the future, what are some of the questions that we have to look forward to? Um, I think one of the big ones is if this becomes a seasonal disease, how will we combat that? Um, number two, what role will vaccines play in future immunity once available? So for instance, we know that with some of our disease modifying therapies, they may interfere with someone developing immunity um, to certain diseases, which is why we usually recommend that people receive vaccines a certain amount of time prior to initiation of therapy or in between doses. So how will that play into how we vaccinate um, for COVID-19 in the future? I think that's also a big question. And then the third question is how can the MS scientific community work together to best treat our patients in the future? So how can you contribute? There are two big initiatives. One is the MS Data Alliance, um, which is a global initiative for data sharing about MS and COVID-19. There are questionnaires that will be available for patients as well as clinicians. Um, and those are not online yet, but they are coming soon. I know that the question for the patients will be available through iConquer MS. And then the clinicians, there will be some um, participating through MS Base, which is a worldwide um, data collaborative effort, as well as there is an upcoming registry collaboration with the NMSS and the CMSC. So there was announcement about this, that it was coming soon. Um, I'm not sure when it will be online, but uh, the information should be available um, through the NMSS, the CMSC, or through NARCRIMS. And it doesn't have a name yet, so. I didn't because they haven't come up with name yet. And then what are other good sources of information? Certainly the CDC, which provides kind of general guidelines. Um, Actrums has developed an online community uh, recently in the past couple of weeks that's been very helpful. I know that also in certain parts of the country, there are listservs. I know that I participate in one here in the Southeast. And then also the Consortium of MS Centers, our societies, um, and the Multiple Sclerosis Academy, which is um, a, an academy um, with some of our British colleagues, including Gavin Giovannini, um, has been very helpful. They have webinars almost weekly on different topics related to both patient questions, as well as related to some of the questions about immunology, et cetera. You can follow me on social media. I'm the nerdy neurologist. <laughs>
And uh, I always end every talk with this slide. All I need is peace, love, and a freaking cure for multiple sclerosis. Thank you very much for your time and attention. And thank you so much to Neurology Live and Women Neurologist Group for organizing this webinar so click quickly and giving me the opportunity to share this information with you. And I will pass it back over to Alicia. I think we have time for a few questions. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Dr. Williams, uh, for that wonderful, informative presentation. Um, so again, I just want to remind everyone watching that you can submit questions. Uh, there should be a question window uh, in your view right now. So please go ahead and submit anything if you do have any questions. All right, so uh, we did have some come through. So our first question here is, how often should we be doing maintenance imaging during this time? Sorry, Dr. Williams, I think you might be on mute Sorry, there. I'm on mute. <laughs> I'm on mute. Sorry. <laughs> uh, so there really, I didn't really see any recommendations about imaging um, during the pandemic. I think that, you know, there have been many efforts to kind of space out our imaging, especially with some of the concerns about gadolinium um, enhancement and gadolinium buildup in the CNS. So I, I, my personal opinion is that um, it would likely be okay if we delayed imaging because oftentimes we make treatment decisions without um, necessarily having new imaging. I think the exception to that would be if someone were, for instance, coming off of natalizumab and we needed some type of new baseline where they had symptoms of PML, um, I think that that would be a particular um, instance where someone would need an urgent MRI, but many of the imaging centers actually are not um, even scheduling routine MRI. So um, I think that it, most likely we would be waiting um, until at least the, the bulk of the pandemic is over before we would start doing routine imaging again. Absolutely. Um, now this was a pretty popular question here. Um, mm -hmm. Can COVID positive patients receive steroids for MS exacerbation? Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I think that again, steroid use would be made on a case by case basis. So, you know, steroids really help speed up the body's ability to recover, but they don't necessarily make you recover more than you would if you didn't get them. So there are many people who have relapses that are not necessarily treated with steroids. They do slightly decrease or weaken the immune system, but you would make that decision with your physician. And fortunately, um, many people have converted to using oral steroids that may be equivalent to our um, IV infusions. So there are ways to get oral steroids uh, at the same type of dosage where you don't necessarily have to go into the center and receive an IV infusion of steroids. Okay. If, that um, is, right. if that is needed. And our next question here, um, if we have a patient who is JCV positive, is there any increased risk, um, even though natalizumab was mentioned as okay to uh, continue with therapy? Mm-hmm. If there is, inc so there is not any data to suggest that a person having JC virus um, and taking natalizumab will put them at increased risk for COVID-19. As far as we know, COVID-19 is not a neurotropic virus, meaning it doesn't necessarily infect the CNS. There is more data emerging about some of the potential neurologic complications, um, but some of those that have been listed um, so far in some of the literature are more related to a systemic immune response and not necessarily related to the infection invading the CNS. So as of right now, there are some suggestions that could um, to Sabri be potentially, um, you know, protective of uh, developing some type of neurotropic issue because it blocks um, cells from entering the CNS. So the, the answer is we don't know um, that there's any risk associated with um, someone being JC virus positive and taken to Sabri in COVID-19. Okay, thank you. Um, our question. next question. Our next question is, is wearing a mask recommended for MS patients that are not positive for COVID-19? And you know, the answer is there's a lot of debate about this. So in many other countries, it is recommended that people wear masks um, and people are wearing masks in China, as well as you saw the recommendations from the Italian MS Society that people should wear masks. Um, here in the US, I believe that the CDC is considering this, but there has not been a um, blanket recommendation that people wear masks. I do see this more frequently in the population, I would say for those who do have other risk factors that may put them at increased risk, such as asthma or um, poorly controlled diabetes or kidney disease, those might be people who would consider wearing masks. 
um, but we don't have the recommendations yet um, from the CDC concerning this. All right, and our next question here is, do you think that long-term patient isolation or confinement will play a role in appropriate treatment management since we don't know how long this will last? Yeah, so patient, so isolation and social or physical distancing is the new term that I've been seeing, is going to be extremely important in stopping the spread of disease. Um, you know, and, I, and certainly it is difficult for all of us being stuck in the house, you know, um, but, you know, if we all do it for a short period of time, it likely will make a huge impact on how long we have to do it. So I am recommending that people do um, practice um, social distancing, but it doesn't mean that you have to be um, emotionally distanced from people. So it's been a great opportunity for me to catch up with old friends and family and their, um, it's FaceTime and Zoom and all kinds of different things. People have virtual cocktail hours, their virtual parties, celebrities are doing virtual concerts. So there's a lot that you can do to keep yourself engaged even though you're at home. So even though you're physically distanced, you don't have to be completely disconnected. Absolutely. Social distancing, everybody. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, Stay home. Stay at home. Please. Um, <laughs> our next question is, um, do you have any suggestions for patients who have had metazantrone in the past? Um, so there really aren't any recommendations. So again, if someone has had a disease modifying therapy in the past that may have been depleting, um, usually once you stop taking that therapy, you should not be still um, experiencing those depleting effects. So it's not something that should be um, lasting. Like for instance, if you took mitoxantrone 10 years ago or eight years ago, you should not still be experiencing immune depletion from that. Um, so usually the depletion or the concern is while you're actively taking the therapy, um, depending on how long it lasts, but not necessarily years after you've taken it. Okay. All right. And here, our next question is, um, mm -hmm. how long would you wait or delay ogrelizumab infusion? So again, case by case basis. So, you know, it, it's really a whole new ball game. So we thought maybe we were going to be at home for two or three weeks. Now, at least here in Georgia, um, everything, school has been suspended for the rest of the school year. Um, social distancing has been recommended um, by the administration until April 30th. So we're talking months. Um, I've had some patients where we've delayed for like a month or two months, um, but certainly if we're getting to three and four months of delaying therapy and if people are having increased symptoms, um, certainly that may be a reason to continue or restart therapy. And then again, some of my colleagues are not really delaying therapy, um, especially for those who have active disease and have been very stable. So it's, it's very individualized based on um, who is treating, who's treating MS. But I've been delaying for um, probably four to six weeks and reassessing to see what we need to do at that point in time. Right. And of all the guidelines that you've shared tonight, um, is there anyone that you particularly align with regarding therapy uh, for your patients? Mm -hmm. So I align quite a bit with um, the British guidelines. Um, I think that they um, are very reasonable. Um, I think that many of our guidelines are also very broad, um, but I liked um, the British ones. They did make some specific recommendations to take into consideration. So I, I pretty much align with that one, I think, for the most part with treatment. Yeah, and we have a, a bit of a non-clinical question now, um, but okay. equally important. Um, what would be the best way, uh, what would your suggestion be to be the best way to transition from office to telework with MS in terms of just reasonable accommodations? Right. Um, so again, it depends on um, if you provide infusions or not. Um, I do have many colleagues who, who do kind of a hybrid where they may see patients, for instance, if they're procedures. I have done quite a few um, intrathecal backlift and pump um, refill. So if there are patients who need a procedure done um, or who need infusions, those patients will likely still be coming to the office, but maybe decreasing the volume, spreading people out so there are not as many there at one time um, to facilitate social distancing would be important. Many of my colleagues, as well as myself, just kind of picked a date and was like, okay, well, from this point forward, whether it's next week or the week after that, um, we'll stop seeing patients in person and then fully convert and then making sure that our staff um, 
and notify people appropriately and that we have certain things in place so that we can see those patients, whether it is with a HIPAA compliant platform. Um, I particularly use um, doxy.me and I use Spruce Health, um, but many of my colleagues, there are many different platforms that people can use. Um, however, CMS um, is allowing more relaxed guidelines so people can use FaceTime, um, they can use Zoom or Skype to see those patients and it would um, not necessarily be um, audited as a um, potentially as a, as a um, as not following regulations at this time. Okay. Um, so most people question... just pick a date and stop. <laughs> sorry, sorry. <laughs> You're fine. This next question, um, I think, is, of course, particularly relevant for a lot of our audience this evening. Um, how mm -hmm. would you revise a patient? How would you advise a patient um, regarding their risk, who is also a healthcare provider, um, especially right. someone who's actively on a DMT? Right. So that's a great question. And um, Dr. Comey did offer some recommendations around, uh, surrounding this at his um, in, in the webinar interview that he did, and I would kind of align with his. So there's some of us that are essential healthcare workers. Um, and so, so far, um, you know, even if you look at much of the anecdotal experience that we've seen, um, many of the people who have developed COVID-19 with MS have had very mild symptoms and have recovered at home without ICU admission. So we want to look at that particular person. We want to look at um, their risk factors. If they had other risk factors, like they were on an immune depleting therapy, they were, um, they had, uh, you know, other comorbidities like lung disease, then those people we may consider saying, you should not be in, um, not should not be working. Um, I think the other thing is that people would absolutely need proper protective, um, personal protective equipment. So they need proper PPE, um, you know, but if someone is an essential worker um, and they're not on an immune depleting therapy and or have any of those comorbidities, then there's not necessarily a blanket recommendation that everyone work from home at this point. Thank you. Um, here's another uh, DMT specific question. Um, do you have any mm -hmm. thoughts about initiating saponamide during the pandemic? So I think the guidelines for saponamide will be very similar to fingolimod. So the concern there would be the potential lymphopenia um, that can be associated, although it is artificial um, because the cells are not lysed or depleted, um, that could potentially increase risk uh, for infection. So um, I would, my personal opinion is that I would likely stick to, um, you know, teraflunamide or DMF. I don't use a lot of the injectable medications at this point, um, but certainly we would consider all those options or netalizumab if someone had aggressive disease. Sure. And one of our last questions, more a bit more generic, um, has there been any indication that there's a difference in prognosis between women and men who um, become positive for COVID-19? So the men seem to fare worse. Um, so yes, the men do seem to have more severe disease and there is more morbidity and mortality among men from what I've seen in the literature and through the reports I've seen. Absolutely. Um, and I guess the last question here um, is, you know, specifically for you, Dr. Williams, in your practice, um, what mm -hmm. are some of, you know, the kind of key concerns or complaints that you're hearing from your patients, um, again, kind of living through this actively right now, um, and, and how are you advising them to kind of carry on? Yeah, so it's a great question. I think the main things um, are that I've received a lot of calls about people. So in the beginning, maybe a week or two ago, there were lots of calls about travel. I have some travel plans. Should I go? Um, what type of activities should I be doing? What type of things shouldn't I be doing? And those are still calls that I receive, but certainly there are a lot less now that there's um, recommendations not to travel, not to go on cruises. Um, but those are some of the most common ones. And then I think that since people have been home, again, um, there's a lot of anxiety um, surrounding if they will be infected. You know, should I 
you know, go see my family or, you know, what should I, sh what should I, what activities should I, or should I not be doing? Those are the most common in terms of disease modifying therapies. I definitely have had several conversations where we've come up with a certain plan um, and then maybe had to postpone that plan um, because um, one of my clinics is actually inside of a hospital that has quite a few um, COVID-19 positive patients. So we're definitely practicing a lot of social distancing there. My other practice um, is in a more isolated area. Um, so just questions about those therapies, we just take it on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, I've pointed people to a lot of support resources, which I think is hugely important, um, mental health and support groups, et cetera, podcasts, um, virtual Facebook groups where they can interact um, and kind of talk through some of these issues that they're having. That's great advice. Well, that appears to be all the questions that we have tonight. Um, so again, Perfect. thank you, Dr. Williams, for putting this informative presentation together um, and sharing your thank insights you. with us. And thank you to our audience for joining us this evening and contributing to this discussion. Uh, the recording of this webinar will be available for viewing on neurologylive.com in the coming days. So please be sure to check back. And remember to stay with Neurology Live for all your latest news and expert insights in neurology. Sign up for our e-newsletters and follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. That concludes tonight's webcast. Stay well and have a great night.